param 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 pam okay not really the good news is that you already know some stuff about music theory whether you are a composer a musician a singer or just someone who enjoys listening to good music, all through your life, your brain has been figuring things out. It's been picking up on clues and cues within the music itself that helps you to understand basic music theory, whether it's in classical music, Baroque, bluegrass, jazz, whatever. Without even having to think about it, your brain is giving you information about the music that you're listening to and helping you fit the pieces together. For example, if I'm playing a song in the key of C, and uh, beginners like, you know, well, like me to some extent, like the key of C because it doesn't use any of the black notes, it just uses the white notes. So that's simple. If I play the basic C major chord, that's called the tonic. That's called the foundational, the root uh, chord of the key of C. And that chord contains three notes. And when I play those three notes together, your brain tells you that those notes fit together. If I play this, your brain goes, yeah, yeah maybe not so much, but that fits. It's a comfortable fit because those notes relate to each other in a certain way. The C, the, the basic foundational note that gives the chord its name, um, that is the, uh, the one that, that defines all the others. It, all the others have names that are given to them in relation to that tonic. The highest note in the chord, in this case it's a G, you don't have to take notes, there will not be a test. That G is called the dominant. And the dominant note gives your brain information that makes your brain expect that we are going to eventually end up back at C. See how that just fits in your brain. The E, which is the center note, that's just the one that ties the others together. It, um, it sort of adds some energy, it adds some movement to the chord, gives it some personality. We know that it's a major chord because that E is there. So we have these three notes that fit together to make one chord. And your brain recognizes that. So if I'm playing a song in the key of C, and I've let you know through the music that that is where we are. Then no matter what else I play, if I play the other chords that fit into the key of C, your brain is expecting that we are eventually going to end up Your brain is wired to recognize certain things in music. It is wired to understand the relationships between notes and to know that it has a beginning and a middle and an end, and that it all comes around again to where we started, that it resolves. And there are things that we can expect. There are things that we can infer from the rest of the music from where we begin. We're going to come back to that idea. Stay with me. So we're talking about the hymn, Holy, 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 which is a brilliant classic hymn, much loved around the world and throughout the years. It was originally uh, the words and the music were written separately. The words were published in 1826 by um, a man who wanted to write a song for Trinity Sunday, 
which is a particular event on the church calendar. It's one week after Pentecost. Pentecost follows Easter. So we've had Easter, which is all about Jesus. We've had Pentecost, which is all about the Holy Spirit. And then we have Trinity Sunday, which ties those together and reminds us of the idea of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, who make up these three persons, one God. This is possibly the most challenging doctrine in Christian, uh, in Christian belief, the idea of the Trinity. If I were writing a book, this would be a footnote. Instead, it's a picture-in-picture -picture rant. If you go on YouTube and look up performances of Holy, 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 you will inevitably find out that there is a particular world-famous choir, whose name I'm not going to mention, who have done a number of, uh, of recordings of the, the hymn, beautifully arranged and beautifully performed. However, they belong to a faith group who do not believe in the Trinity. They do not believe that Jesus and God the Father and Holy Spirit are one. So they take out all references to the Trinity, and they replace them instead with phrases like, God in thy glory through eternity. Now, i got to say, I find that kind of annoying, because the fa they've taken a hymn that was written by a man who believes in the Trinity. He wrote it for an event celebrating the Trinity, he repeatedly includes language pointing to the Trinity. It is traditionally sung, and by them as well, to a tune that was named after an event at which the Christian Church affirms the doctrine of the Trinity. But they have chosen to remove all references to the Trinity and to rewrite it to suit their own theology. As I say... I find that really distasteful. I really honestly, dudes, write your own song. And anybody that's watching this, if you're singing a, a, a worship song, a hymn, and you don't agree with the theology in the song that was written by the songwriter, please sing a different song or write your own. Do not rewrite other people's theology to match your own. Rant over. That word, Trinity, of course, does not appear anywhere in the Bible. The idea of, of Trinity and how we understand God to be um, is something that we inferred from Scripture, from the life of Jesus, from the way he talked about himself and the way he talked about God and what happened when the Holy Spirit came to the church. The word Trinity was coined uh, by a man named Tertullian in around the year 200, approximately. So not long after uh, Jesus' death and during the very early years of the Christian church. But not everybody understood those ideas the same way. And in fact, there had to be this big, this big meeting of the minds, this big conference um, at a place called Nicaea in the year 325, where a whole bunch of thinkers and theologians and writers and bishops and pastors got together and hashed out that understanding of who Jesus was in relation to the Father and the Spirit. And they looked at scriptures, and as I say, they inferred from the scriptures. They would have looked at passages like uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, where it says, The Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And we compare that passage to the first chapter of John, where, where the writer there says, In the beginning was the Word, He was with God, and He was God, and through Him, all things were made. So we put those two pieces together and we say to ourselves, when God spoke, that word was alive and it was a part of himself. 
the writer of John identifies Jesus as that word. So we say, Jesus, the Spirit, and God the Father, as we call him, they were all there in the moments of the creation of the universe. Another place in scripture where we see those, those terms all coming together, and I think maybe um, the most influential verse for us, helping us to understand this three-in-one reality, is uh, in Matthew 28, verse 19, when Jesus commands the disciples to baptize people in the name, singular, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is describing three people who share a name. So three people who are one person. Of course, we don't really understand the Trinity. We try to uh, couch it in terms of, of our real, uh, real world experience to try to help us to wrap our minds around how three could be one and one can be three all at the same time. And we come up with metaphors like um, the three leaves of a shamrock or the three parts of an egg or one plus one plus one or I've heard one times one times one times one equals one. That one almost makes sense except it doesn't really. Or other people go to the idea of water, which can be at various times ice and steam and liquid. But these metaphors are all limited. And if you take them too far, they, they start to fall apart and they start to lead you down paths of understanding about God, like, well, he can only be ice at one time and liquid at another time and steam at another time. So that's not really three being one, that's one being three, but it doesn't work the other way. Even the language of father and son and spirit are words that are taken from our everyday experience, from our lives to try to help us understand who these persons are. an attempt to help us to understand and at the same time hold intention, their uniqueness and their unity. The writers of the words and of the music of Holy, 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 I think did a brilliant job of writing a song for us to sing that helps us to engage with the idea of the Trinity, even if we don't fully understand it. The song doesn't explain it, but the song, I think, represents the idea of Trinity really well. For example, in the, um, in the words, I, I ran this past a poet friend of mine, and this is, this is how he explained it to me. The way the words are written are in a combination of trochaic trimeter and trochaic hexameter, probably pronouncing that wrong, should have asked, but these are uh, terms that describe clusters of three and clusters of six um, that are divided up by pauses. So we say, holy, holy, holy. Pause. Lord God Almighty, pause. Early in the morning, pause. Our song shall rise to thee, pause. You have those threes, and you have some sixes, because that's two times three. But it gives us that rhythm of three in the lyrics to put us into that headspace. But even better, and this is only something that I noticed recently, I think it's absolutely wonderful because what I was saying about metaphors, there's another metaphor for the, for the Trinity and you may be able to guess what it is. Even though we are singing this song in 4-4 four, four time, the music still supports the threeness of the lyrics. 
when we sing that first phrase, when we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Do you recognize that? It's a major chord. It's the major chord that is the foundation of the key in which we are singing. In this case, the key of C. Holy, holy, holy. And we have those three notes that tied together make the chord. Those three notes that express everything that you need to begin to know to follow the logic of the song. We have the root note, the Father. The Father is one who creates, who provides, who initiates, who gives life, who gets everything going. We have the Son. The Son engages with the energy of the Father, and he gets out there. And he does stuff, and he makes things happen. And he does the work that the Father has set for him to do. And then we have the Spirit. The Spirit who leads us back again to the beginning, leads us back to the Father, points us back to the glory and the power of God the Father. This is the Spirit who walks alongside us, who counsels us and teaches us and reminds us and gives us power and gives us gifts. And these three make one. And this one is made of three. Now, like any metaphor, this one will fall apart eventually. But the fact that the songwriter begins the song. And every time in the song we sing those words, holy, 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 we are singing that perfect major chord with those three notes ringing together, those three notes that belong together, those three notes that lead us from one to the next, to the next, and back to the beginning. Every single time we sing holy, 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 we are singing That kind of songwriting can mean so much to us. We don't necessarily analyze it critically. We don't necessarily write an essay about why that makes sense. But music has its own logic. It has its own sense of of movement, its own identity. And every note in the chord has its own identity and its own power just like the Father and the Son and the Spirit. 